And I just said, hey, I'm really excited to talk to you today about the um, how curatorial staff at Anguitha Camry National Museum Wales are re-evaluating uh, many works in the collection uh, to make positive and inclusive changes. So uh, my lecture today focuses on the legacy of what now what has come to be known now as problem objects um, in many museums. And after the events of summer 2020, leading to the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter campaign, um, the question is raised as to how contemporary curators re-examine works acquired over the last hundred or so years. Some of these early works and their subsequent interpretations are based on false but entrenched imperial assumptions of perceived racial superiority. Clearly, these assumptions are unacceptable and need challenging. The histories buried within these works must be fully explored to make their hidden histories visible. Using two current art-based projects as case studies, I will look at how Gwaitha Camry acknowledges the responsibility for its imperial legacy inherited from previous generations of museum collectors. In our post-colonial and multicultural societies, I will focus on how this impacts on a key issue, identity, especially national ones. Next slide on. The projects um, that I'll be referring to are Reframing Picton and Unseen Unheard. Um, they are currently or soon will be on display and you may have been aware of both these projects, especially Picton, the recent TV news and social media coverages, coverage and uh, the controversial debates that this has unleashed. The first study called Reframing Picton revolves around a two metre full length portrait painted by Martin Archer Sheen and it explores the histories hidden behind um, a facade of supposed white Welsh heroism. The second study, Unseen and Heard, looks at identity through a sculpture display intervention. First though, I'm going to show you a clip from a video to introduce the issues we face through a different voice. Um, I hope you can all see it again. Who do we choose to memorialise yeah, we'll in again. our galleries and how? Who decides and what are the wider impacts of these choices on society? Lieutenant General Thomas Picton is a man with a dark past. But until recently, he was solely labelled as a war hero in the interpretation of his portrait by Martin Archer Shee at National Museum Cardiff. We are changing that. Reframing Picton is an anti-colonial collaborative project between Amgyadva Cymru, Sub-Saharan Advisory Panel Youth Leadership Network and Amgyadva Cymru producers. We are amplifying the voices of those originally neglected in the traditional interpretation of Picton's portrait and have commissioned artists with links to Trinidad to create new works that will become a permanent part of the museum's collection. We are here to challenge you to do the same. No museum is innocent. We want you to listen and learn from our honest experience. Displays which hide the truth behind our portraits can have no place in museums in 2021. It is time for you to recognise the responsibility and opportunity you have. This presentation contains reference to slave. Clearly, this legacy has left us with uncomfortable issues that we must confront. <clears throat> And I should also warn you, as the screen says, there are references to enslavement, torture and colonial violence in my paper today. So the problems that we face, it's not uh, just a Welsh problem, it's a UK wide problem. And as Sandra Yeaman, curator of Discomfort at the Hunterian, points out, to comprehend what this legacy means, we need to understand that the issues of racial difference and the false notions of racial superiority developed during the period, previous centuries are not, have not been left behind. Selling human beings, genocide, looting and plundering. And this false ideology has dominated and influenced the attitudes of the time. And while we we'll return to Picton shortly, I hope that this has given you some ideas and questions for later discussion during which I will pose some more questions. And while there are no definitive answers to many of these, um, it will spark some debate. So I'm going to give you some background information into how and why collection building policies of Grace and Family and Grace of Cymru have left us with the legacy we have today. It's frequently been said 
that for all of us to get the most from visits to cultural institutions, we need to see something of ourselves and our histories reflected in the nation's collection. Not least as this enables a feeling of our own validation, asserting in us a sense of our cultural and Welsh identity. It is revealing um, that while white people, this is revealing that um, people of colour have made a huge contribution to Welsh history, but there's little reference to this in the institutions that serve them. In looking at how the implications of early collection policies and how they impact our curatorial choices today, this paper contributes to ongoing museological debates by asking how, within a global and a Welsh world view, do contemporary museum professionals redress what we now acknowledge as the often inappropriate, inappropriate offensive, or let's face it, just plain wrong legacies of our predecessors? How do we rise to the challenge of making them meaningful and relevant to all audiences? In an age of renewed activisms, how do we tackle previous outdated collection building policies designed to assert a specific late 19th century identity? As Kehind Andrews, Professor of Black Studies at Birmingham University, rightly points out in his recent keynote speech at this year's Museums Association Conference, cultural institutions must use their privilege to subvert deep colonial meaning. But how should we do this? How should we explore and reinterpret ideas of what it means to be Welsh or living in Wales today? And who should articulate this? In part, the answer lies in creating new dialogues that expose historical injustice, injustices hidden under assumed definitions of national identity. And this is reflected in the video clip that I've just shown you. Diverse voices expose narratives buried beneath layers of imperial and institutional assumptions that have been masked through an agenda that sought to differentiate Wales from its neighbours. To start to answer these questions, I'll begin by looking at Ngwetha Cymru's early collection building policies, with a focus on the Welsh sculptor William Goscombe John, who played an important role in the development of the early art collections. I will then consider Ngwetha Cymru's approach through both these case studies, before concluding with a short video of the second display. I think firstly, though, a very brief look at Ngwetha Cymru's history will help to contextualise some of the problems that we face today. Wales National Museum was an institution hard fought for. Coming well after its sister institutions in Scotland in 1866 and Ireland in 1877, its Royal Charter was eventually granted in 1907, following a wave of political and cultural Welsh revivals. With a substantial collection inherited from the former Cardiff Museum, Angwetha Cymru's primary imperative was to build an art collection of the highest national importance, to articulate and affirm a positive state in art in Wales. These early collective policies were largely embedded within, in, with, and within an assumed and implicitly imperial worldview that effectively rendered the British Empire an invisible norm. In 1927, the museum was officially opened by George V, following um, a halt in the building during World War I. The ceremonial programme declared that its aims were as primarily and essentially national in character, to teach the stranger about Wales and the Welsh about their fatherland. This did not mean that only Welsh objects would be displayed. Western examples outside Wales was intended to comparatively contextualise and elucidate Welsh distinctiveness. The museum's grand neoclassical design was intended declared, to declare Wales national pride and cultural erudition. It was believed to be the ideal receptacle for a collection of national importance. As a secular institution, and, and despite its protestations otherwise, it offered the Welsh equivalent to the British Museum through a unified notion of white Welshness, conveniently coalesced through early 20th century ideologies. Move on to the next slide. One of those determined to implement these aims was, the, was founding council member and regular benefactor, William Goscombe John. While the Cardiff born um, Royal Academician sculptor, left Wales at the age of 21 to further his successful career in London, he remained committed to his homeland and the museum. 
His visions for the art collection extended to gifts of his own works, over 130, as well as those by other artists that were deemed key. In 1913, as the foundations were being laid, the museum founders were working on a strategy to build a collection worthy of a national institution. John put forward a specific collection building scheme called Methods of Purchasing Works of Art. In it, he condemned what he called the omnium gatherum of works of art of all kinds, prevalent in many institutions. Such haphazard methods, he claimed, should be replaced with an organised system that concentrated on building a characteristically Welsh collection of the highest standard. Such a plan for future guidance was vital to establish collections that would comprehensively represent Wales. It is somewhat ironic that while John is looking to build a legacy for future generations, we are the generation now dealing with it today, but I'm sure not in the way he attended. The first decades of the 20th century were a time of intense institutional competition, as national and international institutions were keenly collecting art. John believed that it is our duty to get without delay important works to give our gallery a character that will be unique amongst art galleries. This distinction was crucial and Guaifa's collection had to offer something that other institutions could not, an emphasis on Welsh art or artists. Without this, our collection, John believed, cannot claim to be representative of Wales or be called national. An important role for the art collection would lie in offering visitors the opportunity to comparatively study works by Welsh and non-Welsh artists. Indeed, John's method stipulated that works by non-Welsh artists should be occasional and by outstanding artists. Amongst these, his contemporaries at the Royal Academy in London, as well as works by his close friends, for example, the adventurer to sculptor Herbert Ward, um, we'll come to him a bit later, were represented in the collections. John and his colleagues were intent on building or constructing specific national identities based on an exclusively white Welsh identity that sat neatly within the doctrines of the British Empire. We can now see the flaws in the approach that failed to acknowledge the deeper implications that were, as Yeaman points out, part of the ideology intended to reinforce their so-called white superiority. And this brings us back to our case studies. So, why Picton? Thomas Picton was the highest ranking British officer to be killed at the Battle of Waterloo, and he was hailed as a public hero. However, he is equally notorious for his cruelty and for sanctioning torture during his time as governor of Trinidad. Until now, Pritzker's cruelty when exhibiting the portrait has not been raised, and this creates an unbalanced pers perspective. Facing up to the uncomfortable aspects of our past and sharing both sides of the story is needed to create change. Pritzker's brutality led to his trial at the King's Bench in 1806, when he was accused of ordering the judicial torture of Louisa Calderon. Calderon was described as a free 14-year-old mulatto girl who was accused of stealing money from a port of Spain businessman, Pedro Ruiz. Ruiz's mother had arranged for her to live with Ruiz as his mistress when she was aged 11. The trial was a cause celebre at the time and was recounted in detail in the papers. However, unable to get, to get a confession through interrogation, Picton ordered that Louisa Calderon undergo a torture called piquetting. Louisa was suspended, suspended by one arm on a pulley rope set in the ceiling. And you can see here in the, the centre illustration here that was used at the trial, the form of torture that she underwent. She was then lowered onto a peg on the floor, barefoot first, until her entire body weight rested on the peg. This would last for up to an hour and would be repeated over a period of days. Louisa did not confess and was imprisoned for a further eight months. Pitton admitted ordering the torture, but claimed that it was legal under the Spanish law still being administered in British-governed Trinidad. The jury, the jury found Pitton guilty, 
but he was never sentenced and the decision was partly reversed at a retrial in 1808. This case highlighted the brutal realities of the British colonial system and colonial slavery. Picton had in fact been accused of several other charges, including the execution of over a dozen slaves. Tellingly, these were not viewed as being serious enough for further action. Picton also supported and benefited financially from the development of slave plantations in Trinidad, and he also made his fortune through slave speculation. So how does this fit within the project? Reframing Picton is a collaborative project led by Angwetha Kermit's Curator of Historic Art, Stephanie Roberts, and working with the Sub-Saharan Advisory Panel, the SSAP Youth Leadership Network. The SSAP are an independent organisation who aim to strengthen the voice of the African diaspora community in Wales. Together, they're working to reframe the narrative around the portrait of Thomas Picton. Um, this was given to the National Collection in 1907, when the Royal Charter was granted by Lord Plymouth. The portrait has been on display in the faces of Wales Gallery at National Museum Cardiff. And while this gallery celebrates people from Wales, it does not allow enough space to explore more complex histories. Picton's portrait has now been temporarily removed from display and replaced by this equally large portrait that you can see on the right of your screen, William Lloyd Hedger and Ditcher by the Dutch artist Albert Huthersen. It was painted in the 1930s while the artist was on holiday in Flintshire and who then developed a fascination with the working life of the Colliers in Trilogan. The decision to move the portrait from the gallery has been made as part of this project and discussion is currently underway on how to show it in a more appropriate context. And part of this includes the commissioning of Trinidadian artists who are working on a creative response to Pitson's portrait. So you might be thinking, why haven't we done anything about Picton before now? And while the upsurge in the Black Lives Matter movement has shown how important it is for Angwetha Kami to address ongoing structural inequalities, work has, however, been underway for a while, as we shall see with Unseen and Unheard. To unpack these legacy issues that revolve around notions of the one gaze and the one imperial white male narrative, we have to assert a line and tease up new meanings that are relevant to, but not exclusively, communities of all classes, including Welsh people of colour, Welsh LGBTQ plus communities, Welsh feminists, and Welsh people with disabilities, all of whom are under underrepresented, if not invisible, in our collections. The museum belongs to everyone in Wales, and everyone should be part of our story. So what is the museum's position? The speaker in the video rightly challenges us. We have a responsibility to address the challenges we've inherited. In line with the Welsh Government policy, and Gwaitha Cymru have made a commitment to becoming an anti-racist institution. And while the interventions under discussion here align with its inclusivity policy, their resurgent activist agenda is now more relevant than ever. Based on the assumption that culture is a human right, and Gwaitha Cymru's policy in consultation with community groups is about democratically recognising and learning from art or objects in the collection and the past events that relate to them. Communities in Wales should be able to make decisions about what items from our collection are displayed and how they are represented in our galleries. While these works and scene stories significantly impact upon our understanding of British imperial identities in Wales and further afield, there's also been a worrying counter development, a backlash politics that leaves curatorial staff and institutions open to, open to wider condemnation by many who feel so-called traditional British values are being undermined. And this, you know, this is still something that is continuing today. Fortunately, Welsh government mandates actively support cultural institutions in re-evaluating their collections unlike sister institutions in England over the past year. Reframing Picton, however, has garnered debates in the media, as Hugh Edwards' recent comments on Twitter have demonstrated. And these projects are sparking debates, and that in itself is a good thing that we have these conversations. Um, 
even when the objective is, dispute, is not disputed, the methodology is often questioned and opinion is divided on the best way to proceed. Nevertheless, despite such debates and uh, opposition from some, and as both case studies demonstrate, resisting re-evaluation misses the point. In contesting established and biased histories, a plethora of exciting opportunities to tell alternative and her stories emerges. Furthermore, these case studies highlight how curatorial approaches are changing towards interventionist um, community-involved ones. We can see this in Tate Britain's relatively recent 2015 Art and Empire blockbuster. While the exhibition curators rightly recognised that the provocative nature of empire was problematic, its overarching message was nevertheless distilled through a top-down authoritarian author voice. Sorry about that. This institutional voice is now tempered by multiple diverse verses, uh, democratically reclaiming hidden histories. We should all see how our stories fit in with the histories of our nation, however uncomfortable that may be for some. As the second case study will now demonstrate. And here, um, there are, this slide shows um, the artists that are represented in this display. The stories behind the sculptures that we are about to consider are difficult. And they highlight that so far we have failed to adequately address issues around the people represented, as well as those who relate to the works. With much in the news about public sculpture becoming a, a flashpoint for protest, as Picton's statue at Cardiff City Hall would demonstrate when it was boxed up and hidden from view in 2020. And furthermore, as Catherine Grant and Dorothy Rowe point out in the Art History Journal, Public sculpture's role as catalyst has been instrumental in sparking public debate and change. Yet, on a smaller scale, the role of the sculpted bust can be just as provocative. Unseen Unheard is a display intervention that brings together important works for the first time in a unique and thought-provoking way. Curated by artist and young producer Omar Kaya Mohammed, who, along with an art historian and museum curator, took part in workshops arranged to help engage and empower local youth communities from all backgrounds, but especially racialized communities. It is their input that starts to reclaim the unheard histories embedded within these sculptures and brings them to the attention of a wider audience. In looking at these works, we need to return to Goscombe John and his friend Herbert Ward. And Ward is pictured here in the top left-hand corner wearing the hat with two of his works. While Ward comes under the rubric of John's outstanding non-Welsh artists, the works of both sculptures are embedded in the colonial endeavours of the time. Before he turned to sculpture, Ward served as an officer for the Welsh-born explorer Henry Morton Stanley himself also a controversial figure. He formed part of the rear guard on the infamous Emma Pasha relief expedition in 1886. The now notorious Belgian King Leopold II funded this expedition as part of his plan to gain an empire in the wake of Europe's scramble for Africa. Leopold, who initially appeared a benevolent king in Europe, acquired swathes of Congolese land that he named the Congo Free State. The timing was auspicious, coinciding with an increasing global demand for rubber. Leopold established, a rub established rubber plantations to supply this de demand. To keep up the pace, he enforced a vicious dictatorship, endorsing the appalling practice of forced labour through which Leopold amassed a great personal fortune. Ward was shocked at witnessing the treatment of the Congolese people, and this led to his instrumental involvement with the Congo Reform Society, with Edmund D. Morrell and Roger Casement. And Roger Casement is pictured here with Ward, and he is the chap with the beard. The society opposed forced labour and raised concerns on public and uh, political platforms. In 1908, Leopold's murderous misrule of the Congolese people was exposed to the world. So how did Ward's work come into our collection in Wales? John was keen to have Ward represented and he convinced, following his death in 1916, he convinced, 1919, he convinced Ward's American widow Sarita, who had already decided to give her husband's work to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, to donate a few examples to the museum. 
This uh, also flags up another issue, and that is notions of competing empires supported by the same ideologies that sanctioned its behaviours. The British perception of their own empire as a generally, um, as a fair and just regime, uh, contrasts with their opinion of others, non-British ones, such as Leopold's, for example. And not only that, John's enthusiasm for artist status over their individual works overrode any suggestion of problematic content, as we shall see in one of John's own works, Vakani, a pygmy chief. I believe that a version of one of these busts is in your art collection at Aberystwyth and is featured in the recent Inconvenience, uh, Inconvenient Objects exhibition. Bacani uh, was one of six Congolese pygmies who was brought to Europe and shown in what was then a hugely profitable business to the British public in towns and cities throughout the UK, UK including Wales. While they mainly appeared in music halls, they were also shown at parliaments, Buckingham Palace and even Glasgow Zoo. They underwent extensive examination as this photograph demonstrates. And they were treated by, Brit by white Britons of all classes as a curiosity. They were peddled as one of the links in the human evolutionary chain, leading to the arrogant perception of the ultimate human perfection, white man of a certain class, of course. It is telling, however, that in 1925, Goscombe John initially offered this bronze bust to the Natural History Department at the museum. And we return now to Ward's works, and this is an Arawimi type and the idol maker. And both of these are based on drawings Ward made of the people he met while on his travels in the Congo. He later settled in Paris and used African models there to stand in with the people he drew. He produced many sculptures, all documenting the people he met. In Paris, he filled his studio with his souvenirs from his travels and sculptures, and visitors came to see them. He also travelled widely, giving talks on his travels. In addition to these busts created by um, 19th century white male artists, we have this work, Head of Paul Robeson, and this is by the 20th century artist Ronald Moody. Born in Jamaica, Moody came to London to study dentistry in 1923. However, the British Museum's collection of non-Western sculpture changed his career path. He decided to become a sculptor and successfully taught himself. While Moody would go on to specialise in wood carvings, as demonstrated by his self-portrait here, uh, this one here on the left, uh, he has depicted the well-known Hollywood singer, actor, activist and athlete who famously championed the cause of Welsh miners in copper and resin. Uh, the other works in the collection, aside from the idol maker, are three female sitters. Already on display, they are related to Gosbrum John. Thirteen is a marble bust of the sculptor's 13-year-old daughter. Martha Vice is a bronze portrayal of the artist's wife as a young woman. And a marble bust age, while a general depiction of female old age, is based on Gosbrum John's mother-in-law, Clara. The display is stalled in the Rotunda, a circular gallery on the first floor at our Cardiff site. The original display was outdated and inappropriate. As Amulkaya explains, and I quote, the Rotunda contains sculptures in the form of portrait busts of white men and women displayed on custom-built plinths, as well as one bust of a man from the Congo who, unlike the other sitters, was in an unlit display cabinet. Until this redisplay, this bust was the only bust of a, back, of a black person on display throughout any of the museum's galleries. To tackle this, the young workshop attendees explored these works and the gallery space by asking the questions, what am I to you? Does it matter if it's true? Following discussions around race, gender and colonialism, workshop participants wrote personal and emotive responses to the works. A vote was held on what the participants felt should be displayed and what they believed should be taken off display and why. El Molkai responded poetically to the workshop's outcomes. And I'd just like to show you a couple of images from the display here. A 
Apart from Moody's head of Paul Robeson, the group felt that the people represented had been classed as objects only identifiable through association with empire, colonialism, or Goskin John. They are now shown as individuals through their stories and experiences. As Amalkaya explains, removing three of the busts on display and replacing them with Paul Robeson and an Arawimi type activates a different story that interacts with other type of busts on display. In addition to the poetry, a sound installation gives these silence head voices that echo around the rotenda's wall. This includes reflective recordings collected by Amalkaya as well as archival soundtracks. For example, we can hear Paul Robeson as he speaks to the miners of Paul's call. Bakani sings traditional songs of his tribe and workshop participants talk about their chosen works. So in conclusion, where next? As Keyhand Andrews points out, there are limits to transformative change in cultural institutions without the support of wider socio-political changes. Through these projects, we are starting to expose the legacy of imperial violence and cultural exclusion brought about through 19th century white male authoritarianism. The collections must be meaningful to all Welsh communities. The historic notions of Welsh identity, identity as uniformly white has lain embedded in the art collections for far too long. And as Dr. Sahira Jamaboy recognises, and I paraphrase, we need to air, air our dirty linen in public to acknowledge the fact of former colon, colonies and its contemporary repercussions. And then as a national museum, it is our responsibility to ensure that the collections are accessible and relevant. Engaging wider communities with the museum and the collections is a start. Although we still have much work to do to create more inclusive legacies for future generations. To finish, the last word goes to Um in her video. So we find ourselves here in the rotunda room of the National Museum of Cardiff, informing its art collection. The sculptor Goscombe John, who was a big supporter of the museum and who donated a lot of his works to the museum. The British New Sculpture Movement, which Goscombe John was a leader of, was really interested in naturalistic representations of the human body, which is quite clear to see in this famous sculpture of his, which is Morpheus, the Greek god of dreams. The title of this work is Age. This is in fact a portrait bust of Goskin John's mother-in-law. And one of the reasons that we will also be exploring what it means to be a specimen and the role that stereotyping and categorizing has played in Goskin John's career. It's quite clear to see why the museum has dedicated this room to Goscombe John, given that he donated so many of his artworks. But I think it's really interesting to think about how the new sculpture movement was interested in naturalistic representations of the body, especially when you look at this sculpture, which was created by Goscombe John's friend, Herbert Ward, of an idol maker. And so we come to Bukhani, the sculpture that kind of sparked it all for me. He is presented here in a glass case that is kind of a grouping of a lot of the different kinds of work that Goscombe John did. He is also the only portrait bust in this room that is currently presented not on its own custom-built plinth. Moreover, as a specimen of a type of human, rather than being valued as a human being in and of himself. We are seeking to close the gap between expressive art objects and the silent exhibition furniture they rest upon with this new display. These plinth covers speak to the stories of the people who rest on them and ask questions that the placards can't hold. The space between personhood and archetypes where often ignored truths reside. This sound art installation completes the redisplay 
and paints a series of audio portraits that hold up a mirror to the neutral tellings of history and what they fail to share, filling the ambient space with public domain audio footage and reflective recordings done by the community, collected and reworked by the artist. Look at this bust, a word now conveniently thrust on what was first called a specimen, a study of the form, for this man was not considered the norm. In a world of whiteness and a world of western rightness. Look at the sculpture of the the Arumi type and think about the exoticism and the violence that it perpetuated against African people such as the Congolese people. Think about how much the sculptors and the people of the West benefited off of them, stole from them. Does that make you feel something? The subject, Rosen, has so many links to Wales. He was even a major um, supporter of the Welsh miners. He supported them when they went down to London to protest. He performed at the Isesbad in solidarity with the miners. My warmest greetings to the people of my beloved Wales and a special hello to the miners of South Wales.